Well, again, uh, congrats on this new record, Wild Type Droid. Uh, definitely keeping with the incredible production of bandmate, engineer, producer, and mixer Ken Andrews. Always love the sounds that he's cranking out. Such great sound and records throughout the years. And uh, this one certainly is no exception to that, uh, that history. But I guess tell me a little bit about it. Sounds like you were writing it over the past year and a half. And uh, did, did I hear you say you recorded drums at, at Grohl, as in Dave Grohl's? Yeah, technically, like we started writing kind of at the height of the pandemic back in August of last year. We um, rented out uh, uh, one of like the local rehearsal spaces. It's more like people usually uh, rehearse there for tours and stuff like it's it's pretty big. Yeah. So we moved in there and brought all of our recording equipment and just spent like three weeks, nine to five every day, just jamming. Wow. And we recorded all of those jam sessions and wound up with about 30 ideas of jams, which we like over the next few weeks, probably six, eight weeks, whittled down to about three hours. Gotcha. Uh, and then we had to go through those and we all just kind of wrote down uh, timestamps that we liked ideas or bars or yeah, sort of compared notes and, and started the, the demoing process and writing process from there. Nice, man. Of those songs that we got from there, we actually wound up keeping the drums from, I think, five songs. Nice. Either four or five songs. And the rest of those songs, we recorded drums at 606. Gotcha. Back in August. Yeah, we did. We did drums in August at his place for the remainder of the songs. Right. I mean, there's always that sort of Zeppelin approach where it's like you get the drum sound and that's the drum sound for the record. But if you record in two different places, obviously those are going to change. But I think one of the interesting things about the more recent failure records is that uh, particular songs have drums that might sound different from other tracks, but suit the song. So, yeah, uh, there's always this cohesiveness uh, in in encapsulated within a failure record but i like that the drum sounds are mixed up according to song and i guess if you're going to record it in two different places you might as well do that anyway because you're not going to get the exact same sound regardless you know for sure for sure i mean what the the only thing all of those things have in common i think fortunately no matter where i record songs they all sound like me playing sure there's a certain way i hit all of my drums that you know no matter what the specific drum sound is uh -huh. it still sounds like me playing it which helps when you're because i tend to like to change snares from song to song or yeah. maybe even change parts of the kit uh -huh. so the overall drum sounds themselves can change but it's still the same person playing them sure the same way uh -huh. so they always sound like they belong together I really like, uh, there's a bunch of really cool songs in this new record. I really like the song Submarines. Uh, just that, just the rhythm, upbeat rhythm of it is a, is a really cool uh, song. But were there any particular songs uh, on this record where you switched up a lot of different drums to, to really suit a particular section and or just that song necessarily? No. I mean, uh, Water With Hands, Submarines, and Headstand, all of those drums are from the rehearsals. Oh, cool. And the only thing different from those takes is I brought, I have this habit of like bringing all of my snare drums, <laughs> but because we were rehearsing, I wasn't really making an effort to change snare drums, you know, cause they weren't really songs yet. I was just playing for right. hours and hours every day. So that's pretty much like a, uh, one of those, uh, Ayot Keplinger with the wood hoops. Nice. And, uh, VK, a VK, uh, bell brass. Oh, nice. I've seen those recently. Those are beautiful. Yeah, he made me one. I don't know if he, normally other people get very specific things. The one he made me was a six and a half. Uh -huh. um, and it was a three with five millimeter re-rings in it. Wow. I don't know how often he makes that for other people, but he made me one of those and I had just gotten it. So that and the, the Keplinger are the only two snares that I used for all of those sessions. And like I said, we kept drums from that for like four or five of the songs. Nice. And the funny thing is, is out at Grohl's place, I used my Q galvanized steel kit. Uh huh. I used the galvanized steel kit for the entire record. Awesome. Um, that never changed. Like symbols and stuff would change. But in Grohl's, I think I used, uh, I had gotten a 1983 Tama Bell Brass. Oh. That I started with. Uh, VK, actually, he saw that I was looking for one. And he was like, hey, dude, I got an extra one I'll sell you. So he sold me that as well. 
and it turns out he had just brought it to Japan and it had it relacquered. Oh. So when he sent it to me, it literally looks like it was straight off of the shelf. No way. It is such a beautiful instrument. It's just mind blowing. Wow. I'm jealous that you have one of those. Those are very revered snares, those old Tama uh, bell brass snares, dude. Yeah. And in this condition is like unheard of. Right. So what I used that. And then uh, uh, I used a Superphonic. Uh, actually, I used that Terminator on uh, um, Bad Translation. Okay. Was the first song we did at Girls Place. Gotcha. But then I, I used a Superphonic, and then I wound up switching to, when Failure got back together, I used almost exclusively this one snare drum for all of the Heart is a Monster, mm. and a lot actually on the last record as well. It's this really weird snare that I had bought it off of eBay with three other drums. And when I got it, I didn't realize like how crazy it was. It's this like three millimeter thick steel with nickel plating. Mm. And it's uh, kind of like the DW um, uh, neural snare where it's got those deep grooves in it. Uh-huh. Uh, it's super heavy. It's about 32 pounds. Damn. I don't know who made it. Really? There's like no manufacturing badge. Like there's no, I have no idea who made it. It's some weird knockoff thing. Whoa. And it is the only snare that I have used live since 2012. That's wild. It's a monster. Um, I was going to ask you about that one. I saw the badge. I've interviewed the guys up at, uh, at Q Drums. I love their drums. They sound amazing. They're such big, yeah. killer drums. Yes. Uh, and I saw the badge. I was like, oh, it looks like he's playing Q Drums. And one of my questions was going to ask you how you've kind of maintained a fairly consistent uh, snare sound live throughout the years. Well, there it is. You've been playing the same snare. And again, like it's the same person hitting it. Right, right. When I started doing these sessions back in February... One thing that I did do during the pandemic was um, uh, I bought all of these snare drums that I've always wanted. Yeah. Um, and for the first like couple months, I was bringing out like, you know, five, 10 snares and I was using them all on every single song. And they kind of always almost just sounded the same. <laughs> yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, because it's me playing it. Yeah. For the most part, unless I get a particular song where I'm playing like really, really light, you know, then the sound changes. But I love to hit rim shots. Sure. You know, and I just generally I, I have a thing that I really like playing and it feels really good to put that thing, that type of energy on songs. Yeah. Um, and snare after snare after snare, wood snares, metal snares, bell brass snares, like they all generally sound the same. Yeah. I I was very happy about it, but I was also a tiny bit bummed out. Yeah, you got all these snares. Because, you know, I just spent like <laughs> 25 grand on, you know, snare drums and they're like in every closet and in the garage. Like, I don't have any space left to store anything else. <laughs> I just started using actually the Q drums in 2019. Okay. Uh, for on the last record. Mm -hmm. um, but before that, I mean, I had exclusively drum wise, always just used Gretsch. Yeah. I endorse, I endorse Gretsch. Right. And all the previous tours, like I would always play Gretsch drums. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Jeremy got me, I went out and visited one of his places and I just like to switch it up mainly for tours. Uh -huh. uh, and I really love the aesthetic of those galvanized drums. Oh, they're beautiful. So I went out to his shop and played one and they sound ridiculous they're badass um and they're just not they don't have all those crazy overtones like most metal drums that's right because they put those re maple re-rings which really focuses the sound and yeah. kind of tampers down some of those unruly frequencies mm -hmm. the proof being like we just recorded a record and they sound phenomenal they sound great um and not once was ken like i don't know man there's some crazy stuff going on in the sound of those toms mm -hmm. Uh, he just loved it. I just put him up and we started recording. That is awesome. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, you know, I was going back and listening to uh, the previous record, uh, again, abbreviated as In the Future. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a song on there, Distorted Fields, and there's a really weird sounding cymbal that you play in one section. And I have a cymbal that sounds suspiciously like it. 
which is this weird uh 18 inch breakbeat effects zildjian symbol yeah it's got like the holes and stuff in it this one doesn't have any holes it's supposed to be like a breakbeat ride that zach D- zach danzinger uh design is was that what you were using on that by any weird chance well the it's funny the original demo that ken did ken wrote all of it uh-huh and he had this insane program drum part that i like worked on and worked on and then kind of gave up on it (laughs) and you know sat around was like am i being lazy am i not just pushing myself can this be played and i'm sort of giving up too soon Mm -hmm. Uh, and i actually sent it to like dave elich and a couple other drum friends and they were like yeah i mean you know technically you could play it but it wouldn't sound cool like it's just doesn't have any movement Uh and it's so like just polyrhythmic and stiff and you know like there's no wavering either side to make the beat actually move Mm -hmm. everything has to be played dead on like a drum machine right in order to be able to play what he programmed yeah so what i did is okay so i'm not crazy um and i'm not like giving up and being lazy so how can i take because this has to stay like it's such an integral part of the way everything in the song was glued together was this drum beat. Mm -hmm. Um, So what I did was I basically took what was previously these hi-hat lifts, Mm -hmm. which were impossible to play because the kick drum is so syncopated and everything is really syncopated. (laughs) Um, So I just took them and I put them on this effect symbol that I borrowed from SIR, Mm. like one of those minor effect symbols with holes in it. Uh Um, That's what that is. And then I put it up just above my hi-hat So I could play like this really fast 16th note groove and just play that as the accents without breaking, oddly enough, you said break beat. Right. So I wouldn't break the beat. Uh Uh-huh. I could include that if I set it up really close to the hi-hat. Yeah. Uh, But that's what that is. Okay. Um, And live, I just wound up using uh, a pad. Oh, gotcha. I can only have a certain number of mics. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, because of our stage setup like (laughs) everything is kind of set in stone right i believe it so i just slowly add more electronics and just plug them into my spds yep so i i just set up a pad that i used for you know probably like two or three other songs nice that i could just interchange the sounds from song to song right on yeah it's weird i'll try to record that breakbeat ride that i have it sounds very similar super super dry almost awkward to play and i've never actually recorded it to hear how it sounds coming through mics but when i heard that i was like it's kind of uncanny how this to my ear sounds like that one that i have it's interesting i'll I'll take a picture of it and send it to you so you can see which one it was there there's a lot of them and actually that type of sound has become super popular in the drum world over the last like absolutely you know six or so years yeah like annika miles Mm -hmm. that have you ever seen her online she's a crazy technician she has a lot of those things and uh uh, thomas lang has a lot of those things like you're seeing more of the like look at me look at me look at me types like (laughs) really incorporating you know just alternative symbol or even percussive Sure. sounds yeah, yeah, yeah. in their setups yeah you mentioned the live uh setup and how it's kind of set in stone i actually had a question for you about that the once again uh, in addition to the the band sounding amazing in recorded format live as well always sounds just incredible and i was going to ask you about those translucent circular baffles that you put in front of the symbols i didn't know if that was to decrease bleed through the mics or if it was to keep the symbols out of ken and greg's ears or both but how cool do they look? <laughs> they look pretty cool, man. For me, the main purpose of those, because the, the idea of putting some kind of baffling up has been tossed around for years. And I'm always like, no, fuck that. That's, yeah. They just, it always looks stupid. Right. And, you know, the idea of in a three piece band, putting one of the people inside of a box just seems like a disaster to sever like that, that energy. connection yeah for sure dude it's this guy he's out of texas and he makes them and i as soon as i saw them i was like well there we go that's nice. the solution it looks really cool and it won't like you know snip the connection between me and the other guys yeah. but the the main reason for it is we record all of our live shows 
Basically, our setup is a recording studio put on the stage. Wow. There's no live amps. Everything is like in the Axe Effects units. Um, like I'm the only thing like emitting sound live. Wow. Um, and even then, like all of, I have a dedicated number of live drum mics mm. um, and everything else is electronic. Wow. Yeah. No click tracks. Like everything is played in real time. Wow. Which is insane because a lot of the things that I have to play on my electronics are like time delayed stuff. Right. So at every given moment, I have to be playing each of those songs in the exact tempo. Yeah. So I kind of cheat a little bit. I've just got one of those little flasher things that I can look down to. Like everything changes. We have everything dialed in. Like Ken hits a pedal in between every song and it moves to uh, all of the sounds um, and the lyrics and everything for the next song. Whoa. And we all run iPads. It's crazy that that's not locked into a click because, wow, you're, uh, I mean, I appreciate it. <laughs> it makes it much, much, another thing that, you know, uh, I personally am just like begrudgingly, it's a lot more work and it's a lot more like you really have to be on your game from moment to moment, 100%. but it's, you know, I mean, I've been doing it a long time. It's like, I'm constantly looking for ways that I can be challenged. Yeah. And that, that definitely is one of the ways. Although that being said, we did these last two records. We didn't have any click tracks. We performed everything live. It was great. Everything works the way it is. What would happen if we were to incorporate the technology that I think most people are using, where you actually have a track? Right. You know, and you, you incorporate maybe, because when we learn, when we record a record, we have to go back and learn it. And then we have to go back and decide which of those parts is absolutely integral to perform this thing live. Absolutely. There's a casualty to making the decision of we're not going to use any backing tracks live. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good songs that, you know, we could be playing if we were to do that. So on the, on the, in the future tour, uh, we chose two songs actually from that record where we did it. It sounded great. It felt great. I mean, I record all the records with a click track. Yeah. So it's not a problem to like push and pull and make it feel like it's a living, breathing thing. Yeah. Um, there isn't that problem. But the one problem there is, is it kind of takes out. There's no longer any interplay between the band members and any natural flow to a set. Sure. Because you're starting and everyone's got to come in. Mm -hmm. And nobody can do anything that isn't supposed to be in there you know so it, it is definitely restricts um what you can do like as a live sort of living breathing unit yeah but i i think it enhanced the show because we used it for a very targeted part of the set mm -hmm. um you know and then there's the other hour and a half where we're just like you know this crazy loud living breathing like whoa those guys play really good together. <laughs> Absolutely, man.